Okay. <clears throat> Can a student receive autism services from the school system under the exceptionality of other health impairment? Now, the medical diagnosis of autism, anxiety, ADHD, uh, is what um, your child has. Um, now, can they receive those services under OHI without meeting the, and I don't know what 1508 the criteria, uh, without meeting the criteria for autism according to the school's evaluation? Okay, I'm, I don't know what 1508, I'm going to sit there and just pretend that that was just a typo. Um, and then go with the rest of it because that makes absolute sense. And the answer is yes. Okay, if your child has a medical diagnosis of autism, um, but then is qualified under a different exceptionality, okay? Because there's, there's in most states, the majority of states, there's 13 eligibility categories uh, for special education. So we serve the child. Uh, and if your child makes it into uh, or gets their foot in the door with regards to special education, the only area where there's going to be a question mark for me with regards to this this logic that school systems uh, like to put out there that that, uh, you know, we serve the child, we don't serve the disability. If they have an IEP, then all things should be considered. Yeah, that's nice in theory, uh, but I've had way too many cases to where you know, the school system will absolutely ignore a medical diagnosis uh, for whatever reason. And it's intentional that they do it that way. So, like I said, nice in theory. And actually, the theory is correct uh, per the, the, the requirements, the law. The only area where, where I have some question marks within more of the traditional exceptionalities would be speech language impairment. Because under that one, that's a bit unique in that instead of having the case manager uh, who sort of directs the, the IEP, instead of that being a special education teacher, uh, it, it's, it's going to be the speech language pathologist because the impairment or the exceptionality is speech language impairment. So because it's the speech language pathologist, then that moves the speech and the language issues into the prime primary spot. And because the speech language pathologist has an expertise singular to um, speech language issues, then at that point, it's, it's sort of difficult for, for an IEP team to think outside of that box, even though there's nothing that says that they can't or they shouldn't, okay? Uh, because I, I can't tell you that's one of the biggest areas of due processes, due process complaints um, is where the school system early on identifies a child with speech language impairment, which is sort of an easy category for kids that so let's say have ADHD and autism, especially uh, because sometimes the autism um, is unknown. They don't see enough of it, but they absolutely can see the uh, speech language impairment. Other kids that have developmental disabilities, but let's say don't don't reach their uh, uh, greater than 25 or 30 uh, percent um, uh, disparity, you know, with regards to their developmental um, scales, you know, the assessments that they do. So the speech language impairment be, tends to be the one that, that they'll go, well, you know, that's what that's the easy thing. We can see that we can see all these other deficits, but you know, this is when it comes to the IEP and putting it together, you know, this is what ends up being uh, the situation. And then these kids end up going at least three years, maybe, unless they're evaluated sooner um, to where they're, they're not being serviced globally or wholly, holistically. You know, they're, they're only concentrating on that one thing and largely because the expert or the professional hat that, that's put in, in control or charge of that child's services is a speech language pathologist. Now, outside of that, the, the more traditional exceptionalities uh, like OHI, autism, specific learning disability, um, intellectual disability, uh, those kind of, of emotional disability, those kind of things um, still have a special education teacher 
as the case manager and then the professional expert hats like occupational therapy, speech language, physical therapy, uh, behavioral therapy, all of those things become, you know, more related service providers sitting at the table making decisions. Uh, and, and then, like I said, sort of the, the key player would still be the, uh, the special education teacher, the general education hat, and, and the LEA. So in your situation that you have a diagnosis of autism, you have the diagnosis of ADHD, what they're saying is, well, we don't, uh, we don't see what they call educational autism, meaning that your, your child's autism to them um, just isn't manifesting itself to the point where it's impacting him in the educational environment. That's baffling to me, uh, number one, because many of the components uh, for eligibility under autism, especially if you have a diagnosis, um, some of those secondary eligibility factors that the states require mirror that of ADHD, especially when it comes to the rating scales filled out by teachers. So I would be a little bit, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have some major questions as to how your child qualified under other health impairment, but not under autism if you have a diagnosis. Um, and an ADOS confirming the diagnosis, that, that, that's a little questionable. But regardless, your child has a medical diagnosis of autism. Your child's qualified under um, other health impairment. The IEP team has to consider all deficits in the educational performance areas. Now, what are the educational performance areas? Well, you have academics, communication, and social emotional development that would include behavior. So the services and the goals need to focus in these three areas and they're all encompassing. So at that point, yes, the medical diagnosis of autism becomes incredibly important uh, because they need to address the deficits attached to that diagnosis. And if they're recognizing the ADHD, then there's a there's like I said, there's a lot of crossover between those things that could be addressed inside school. So, um, how does it impact academics? How does it impact communication? And you also need to look at social communication through what's called pragmatics. Uh, so they need to do a language evaluation. If they haven't done one, they need to do one and include a pragmatic piece. But I can tell you, if your child has ADHD and autism, then I'm going to be hard pressed to have somebody tell me that there's not going to be underlying language deficits that need to be um, um, either habilitated or rehabilitated inside the public education setting, because that language piece for those two disabilities uh, tends to be there, even if it's doesn't meet their discrepancies of severity, it's still there. And, and the communication or the language deficits, even social language deficits, end up filtering over into social emotional development, including behavior, and then the, uh, goes the other way and tips into impacting academics to where it could give the appearance uh, either real or um, a, a false positive of something like dyslexia. So, um, it, Yes, they need to absolutely look at your child as a whole, um, and they are required to do that. Why are they required to do that? Is it written down somewhere to where they're required to do that? No, not necessarily, but they're required to provide your child with a free and appropriate public education, and that's where that comes in. And, and they can't look at 25% of your child. They can't look at 75% of your child. They need to look at all of your child. And, and, you know, I absolutely get frustrated with school systems that take this attitude of, well, we just don't do that, or we just don't see that here, or we, you know, I'm sorry, guys, but your school system is a therapeutic setting to prepare children to become adults so that they can pay taxes and, and be economically viable, so they can live independently, so they can continue their education. Why? Well, they can get a degree and pay more taxes. So do you understand that that's why Congress funds this stuff? That's why your state funds it. And all of those things exist outside of the public education setting. The entire goal is to prepare these kids for life 
outside of the education setting. So to sit there and have these arguments of, well, we only look at how it's impacting the child in the education setting is absolutely a farce because that's not written anywhere either. Now they're required to um, cover your child's educational performance deficits. But like I said, those deficits include communication, which includes social communication and social emotional development, including behavior, not just academics. So uh, that's what they need to do. Wraparound services, we serve the whole child.